would like to introduce Swamiji, which is a very difficult task to do properly, in fact, an impossible task to do properly. We often think of a man in terms of what he has accomplished in life, and Swamiji has accomplished so much more than most people can even imagine accomplishing in life. As we know, he has written more than 80 books, I believe it's now 84 or 85, two of which have just come out in India today, have just arrived, in fact, are out on the book shelf out there today, the book table. And he has written more than 400 pieces of music, three of which you heard this afternoon as we sang at the very beginning of the program. He has accomplished so much in life. He has created communities in the West, seven of them now. We're creating an eighth here in India. All of these things, they sort of boggle the mind. How can, how can one man write 85 books, some of which are bestsellers in the West and in other parts of the world, translated into 27, 28 languages available in some 80 or 90 countries in the world? It, it boggles the mind. And I would like to propose one simple thought. He does it by the power and the grace of yoga flowing and the energy that flows through. He also does it in a very interesting way. He does not think of himself as a separate human being cut off from the river of life. He is able to work through other people. He is able to accomplish so much more because there is no block in that flow of energy. And it is our very special privilege to be able to hear his words and feel the vibrations that flow through him this afternoon. Today marks the beginning of a great adventure. Our speakers who have spoken so eloquently and heartfully have alluded to this journey that is in front of all of us, an opportunity for all of us. And I thought I could give you just one other little taste of who is this person who has authored this amazing course, who has accomplished these amazing things in life. You can measure a saint in a certain kind of way. You can't really measure a saint by any means at all. But you can measure in a certain way by looking at who are his followers and disciples and what level of commitment and direction do they bring to it. And I thought to share just one simple question, one simple thought or observation, which might be a little bit surprising to you. When we came to India in late 2003, a group of 10 or 15 of us began this work with Swamiji. It's a very unusual thing to begin a work of this magnitude at Swamiji's age, now in his 80th year. That group, each separate person, paid their own way over here. Now one or two or a small handful, that might make sense. We have a staff of around 25 people. Each person has paid his own way not only to get here, but to remain here. There are no salaries among the Westerners here. This is an entirely voluntary operation. And I just wanted to point that out because the level of commitment that these people have given, given their lives and their pocketbooks to this process, it's just a small glimpse of the kind of commitment that Swamiji himself has brought to bear on his life and his devotion to, to his master, Yoganandaji. There is no other author who is a saint and who has applied his mind to the aspects of material success in this way. And it is our very special honor and privilege to hear him speak this afternoon. Please join me in welcoming Swami Kriyananda. Good afternoon to all of you. <clears throat> this afternoon, I want to begin by inviting all of you to join me and to become partners with me in a new vision. That vision, in a sense, began very interestingly. A year and a half ago, I was in the Privat Hospital with pneumonia. 
And I was stretched out, practically unconscious, when a doctor came in, not my regular doctor, I should say, and he came to me and he said, Sir, I would like to ask for, your, for advice. Well, usually when you're in a hospital and desperately ill, they come to give advice. He said, Sir, I would like to know how can I meet my practical needs in life and follow the principles of yoga and dharma in which I believe. And I said to him, if you follow the way of dharma, you will be more successful. Well, I'm afraid I was not a good advertisement for success, lying there practically unconscious. And I thought the next day, that is just what India needs today. Let me tell you a little bit about myself so that you can understand whatever I may have to give to this course. I was born in Romania, but of American parents. I am really not American or Romanian or anything else. In a way, I'm more Indian than anything else, but really I'm just, wherever I am, I am at home. But in my international upbringing, I grew up in what uh, my father's company was Esso, which was, now it's Exxon in the West, but it's the Standard Oil Company of New Jersey. And at that time, it was the largest company in the world. He was an executive in that company and was given the French Legion of Honor for his discoveries in France. And he was a man uh, I got to meet. All, all the people I grew up with were executives and leaders in this very large company. I grew up, you might say, with big, big business. I also grew up hating big business. I had absolutely no interest in it. At the age of 16, my father offered to buy me a tuxedo. This is the sort of dress that a man wears when he goes to the opera or to big banquets or whatever. I said, Dad, don't bother. I will never earn enough money to pay income tax. And in fact, that has been true because I became a monk at the age of 22 and I have always lived a kind of life that you might say, well, what can he tell us about business principles? Well, in a way, I can say it's in my blood. I grew up with it. I was surrounded by it. And my father and his friends were honorable people. I didn't dislike their way of life because of their lack of honor. They were very truthful, sincere, honest. All the good qualities that you hope for in business, but often don't find. But I did not like what they were offering. I did not like buying a beautiful home in the suburbs. We lived in Scarsdale, which is supposed to be the millionaire's zone in America. We, I did not like having a home there. I did not like getting married and having children. I did not like any of those things. And I just I couldn't stand the thought of growing that way. I wanted to become a hermit. I wanted to know God. And I didn't know how. And then I found Autobiography of a Yogi. Now I know that many of you have read that book. Perhaps all of you have read it. I also know that many of you think that, well, here, I don't know you, I don't say you specifically, but many people in India think, here is this sweet and wonderful young man who had the grace and the wonderful opportunity to meet all these great saints. Well, when I read that book, I said, this is what I want. I took the next bus from New York to Los Angeles where he was living, a journey of four days and four nights. The first thing I said to him was, I want to be your disciple. I have never had the least doubt on that score in my life. I lived with this great man of God from 1948 until now, nearly 60 years. <coughs> he passed away in 1952, and he asked me, he said to me, you have a great work to do. And I didn't want to do a great work. I tried to get away from it. I tried to <coughs> get him to change his mind. What I really wanted was to be a hermit. Well, that has not been my karma. And I am grateful that it is not, because when I came to him, I had two desires. One was to know God, but the other was to find some way of sharing inspiration with others. I thought people are wandering in darkness. They, 
Their materialism has given them so much outwardly, and what have they got? They gather together and talk about nothing. They work, 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 and at the end of it all, when people in my dad's company uh, retired at the age of 65, within two years they were either dead or senile. They'd lost interest, they had nothing to live for. What kind of a life is that? We have been born for a noble purpose. <coughs> and when I came to India, my guru often said that someday America and India will join hands and lead the world on the path of dharma, on the path of how to live rightly in this world, spiritually as well as materially. When Marco Polo came to, well, as you know, he went to China, but he also passed through India on his way back to Venice, Italy. And, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> oh, that's the spirit. Thank you. <coughs> His comment on India was very interesting. It was in the, around 1200 AD. He said that India is the richest country in the world. He lived here long enough to see that. It's very strange that after just a few centuries, England came here, India became one of the richest countries, if not the richest. India became a poor country. One cannot but suspect a cause and effect relationship. I have noticed <clears throat> in my worldwide travels, which really have been worldwide, that wherever Indians go, within one or two generations, they're at the top of the pile, you might say, because they have intelligence, they have ability. <clears throat> Whatever they do, they do well. But I have noticed in coming here, see, I came here in 1958, I lived here for four years, and it is, as people have been commenting, I have to admit it, it has not been easy at my stage of life, at my age, to begin a new work in this country. Thank God I have some very good co-workers. But I am dedicated to this dream that my guru held up before us, that someday India and America will join hands. India has developed spiritual efficiency through the science of yoga. And you know, Swami Ramatirtha, when he was in America back at the beginning of the, of the 20th century, end of the 19th, I'm not sure of the exact year, he predicted someday you Americans will take this yoga science and make it practical and bring it back to my people. And when I was lecturing in Delhi 45 years ago, in fact, Mr. Beach and Indu and others, I met them in December of 1959, a long time ago. Many of you were not yet born then. And uh, this consciousness that my guru brought, people wanted when I was lecturing here. I had 2,000 people at a time coming to my lectures. But they were, they were tired of having the Shastras quoted at them. They wanted to know how can these teachings be relevant to our daily lives. And the truth is, and I have had to find it in my life, and again I will go back to talk about my life a little bit. I have found that by sticking with, with dharma, <coughs> by living by true principles, I've been able to succeed in a way that many people are surprised at, and I suppose it might be something laudable. I have to say that the reason I've succeeded is that I didn't do anything. I let him do it, but I did not let him do it by sitting back and dreaming and saying, God, you do it. Many years ago, I was giving a lecture in Los Angeles. <coughs> Excuse me. And I thought my guru told me to, when I speak, let God talk through me. I thought, well then, let me get out of the way and let him talk. So I decided not to speak. And I stood there, you know, when you're talking to a room full of people, a hundred or more people, when you suddenly stop speaking, people begin to get anxious. And some of my friends were perspiring, thinking I had frozen with fear. But no, I was perfectly comfortable. I was just waiting for God to speak. <laughs> Finally, I had, after two minutes, two minutes of silence under those circumstances, there are a lot. I finally thought, he isn't going to. My guru taught, 
said, I will pray, I will reason, I will will, I will act, but guide thou my reason, will, and activity to the right thing in every right path in everything. And I understood <coughs> that we have to act, but we have to draw on his inspiration. We cannot say, I am doing it, and be nearly so successful. I have found quite a few times in my life that I've had a project in writing, and uh, I haven't had the time to really think it through because I've had a deadline. There was one, Warner Books wanted me to write a book, uh, uh, first of all, on meditation for starters. This was due out in about, uh, well, the summer of, uh, or the spring of 1995. In April, they phoned me to say that no, they didn't want that subject, they wanted a, a book on superconsciousness. Well, you can't just take a new title and plaster it on an old book, you've got to rewrite the whole book, as you would know. It's not so easy. The book I was thinking of writing was easy for me. Meditation for starters, well, that's nothing for somebody who's been teaching it for many years. But to write a book on superconsciousness, I thought that would take at least two years to write. I said, well, how long will you give me? They said, two months. And two weeks of those two months were already, um, uh, they were taken up commitments to lecture in different, different parts of the country. So basically, I really only had one month. I closed the doors, I wouldn't see any mail, I wouldn't receive any telephone calls, I just wouldn't see anybody. And for one month, I just threw myself into it. I said, I can't do it, but you can. And every time a problem would come up and I think, oh, this is more than I can handle, I'd throw myself into it and suddenly the answers came. And they came without, without my knowing in beforehand what they were. It was astounding how, well, what happened was that the last day of June, the day before that, I was able to send the finished manuscript by Federal Express to New York. This sort of thing is what I'm trying to help you through this course to understand, that there is a higher wisdom that you can tune into, that if you understand business in the right way, you don't have to rely just on your little brain. It's amazing what you can accomplish in practical ways. I learned some of these things back in college. I remember that I took a course in Greek. Well, it's not really truthful to say I took it. I was enrolled in it. I didn't go to class. I did no assignments. I was just, <coughs> I was just, I was through with college. I didn't like what they were teaching. And one week, the, well, in preparation for the class, I would sometimes come and the professor would start preparing us and I would recognize out of a paragraph of Greek, the words like uh and the, it was pretty pathetic. The professor said, well, of course, there are some people in this class who might as well not even come to the exam. And everybody would look at me and laugh. And I said, no, I'm going to pass that course. And the week before the exam, I picked up the book and I said, I'm really going to study it, do it well. I thought, it's too difficult. I'm just not interested. And I put it aside. I'll say, I said, I'll do twice as much work tomorrow. Well, the next day came, I didn't do it again. A whole week went by, and suddenly, the night before the exam, I, <coughs> I thought, my God, what am I to do? And in that, you know, they say necessity is the mother of invention. Well, necessity was a good mother at that moment. <laughs> suddenly, I got an inspiration. I told myself, you're a Greek. You know, suddenly thinking of myself as a Greek and really putting myself into that bav, I was a Greek. And somehow I read the book on Greek and it all was very easy. I tuned into that consciousness in humanity which produces the Greek language. And to make a long story short, I did take the exam the next day. It was a difficult exam and only two people passed. I was one of them. <laughs> How? Not my credit. Credit to these principles. I had stumbled on a very important truth. If you think you cannot do something, you cannot do it. If you think you can do it, 
You have to take the practical steps, but remember this mind, this brain of ours is very limited. And if you can learn to understand that there's much more behind it and to be sustained by that, then you will be amazed at what you can accomplish. Now, none of you here in this room, I'm, I'm guessing, but I think it's a fairly uh, um, safe guess, none of you is interested in learning Greek. But you are interested in achieving, maintaining, and achieving greater heights of success. Now, in that, <clears throat> I had to begin starting our communities. I had no money. My father was well-to-do, yes, but my father absolutely disapproved of my yogic way of life and would not give one paisa to what, my, what I was doing. He never helped one cent. But I was determined to create a community because my guru had wanted communities. Now, you don't start such things without money. I'm not the kind of person who can. It's not a question of desire. I simply cannot toady to rich people. I just treat them as brothers and sisters. And I've grown up among them, but I don't look up to them. I don't look down on them. They're just brothers and sisters. And so I never flattered people, and rich people usually sort of didn't feel those who wanted flattery. They didn't get what they wanted from me. And so how could I build a great work? I had no rich supporters. I had to earn it myself. I gave classes. There were people in America who have earned much money giving classes in these things. I refused to earn money from people. I wanted to give to them, but I did discover one thing, that unless they paid something, they didn't take it seriously. It was like when I studied singing. <clears throat> My teacher said, they will be five dollars every lesson. It's not that I need the money, you need to pay it. She was right. I had to go out and earn the money because I never would ask my father for it. And uh, I worked in restaurants and so on. But I earned the money to give her that five dollars every day. This is the truth, that you need to do it for your own sake. Well, I did charge a little bit, but I tried to put it at a level where everybody would be able to afford it. And if they simply couldn't, I gave it anyway. Well, with that, I built Ananda. And it has been a, a, well, it's been a big work. There are about a thousand people there living there now in all our different communities. We have 25 of them here, and they have all come with that same spirit of giving. Because we believe in this mission of our guru, you might say, well, why would you come here? After so many years, you've had your great success in the West, Ananda is very well known. It has hurt me to see that this great guru with such a powerful message to give to the world is not understood in sense of his mission here that can, that can help India too. One thing that surprised me, because I, as I said, I, I had had that world. I didn't want more of it. I wanted to be a hermit. It surprised me when he, st when he stated as his unequivocal truth that scripture should, should help man physically, spiritually, mentally. But physically also, he made the astounding statement that earning money is the next greatest art after finding God. Now, how can you figure that one out? And yet it's the truth. If you don't have the ability to function in this world effectively, not greedily, but effectively, then you have not yet found uh, the happiness that you've been hearing about. Success is not just money. Success is all-rounded love. How many tycoons is a cartoon I saw of this man standing proudly surveying his great factories and steel uh, mills and everything, standing in the top floor office of his, his uh, um, big enterprise, and his wife came in in rags and says, Dear one, we'll be able to use some of this money for ourselves. <laughs> well, um, that's not success. You have to accept and learn to handle all aspects of your life. Well, this is what my course tries to accomplish. I, try, I have tried to show people what I have had to do in my own life to learn how to succeed in a practical way. I've had to fight the usual battles, people trying to foreclose on me, people trying to destroy me. I've had so many battles, and yet anything that I've had to face, I remember when I was beginning Ananda, I almost resented 
having to earn that much money. And yet, at the end of it, when I did earn it, I realized that the, what I had really gained was not the money, yes, that came, but the strength of will to do whatever God has given me to do. Now, God has given each one of you a job to do. Do it well, and you'll find that you succeed much more. There have been times in my life when certainly I might have been tempted to <clears throat> go the shortcut. One time, when I was, Ananda was very new, a young man came to me and said, I've inherited uh, quite a bit of money. I would like your advice. Should I stay here? I'm willing to stay here if you say so. Or should I go to India? I said, how much money was it? He said, $200,000. That was, back in 1969, that was a lot of money. And I meditated. I wasn't even slightly tempted to say, well, stay here, because that money would have built Ananda. I said, I think that you should go to India. I, it was not even a temptation for me. I wanted to do what was right. At one point, there was a forest fire. I live, our main community is in the forest where uh, the fair Sierra Nevada foothills. And uh, there was a forest fire that destroyed 450 of our acres. We had about 650 acres at that time. 21 of our 22 homes. It was a disaster, and we had no insurance. Everybody assumed that we would simply go bankrupt. <clears throat> At that time, neighbors telephoned us excitedly that they had discovered the cause of the fire. It was a faulty spark arrester on a county vehicle. They said, we can sue the county and get all our money back. I wrote to the supervisors. I said, I know that you're think, worried about us because we were the biggest losers. I said, we will not be suing. And... Uh, we did not. Everybody said we would go bankrupt. We're still here. In fact, the day after that fire, we were just out there with joy, cleaning everything up. And 10 years later, our neighbors were still weeping over what they had lost. One of our couples, um, the wife had just 10 days earlier given birth to their first child. And they lost everything. And he said, well, dear, never mind. At least now we won't have any more trouble with the leaks we were having in our, in our roof. Well, that's the kind of spirit that Ananda has fostered. And the wonderful thing about it is that it works. That with the right attitude, without thinking, what can I do to maybe squeeze money out of other people to succeed? If you don't look at opportunity as a personal thing, there is a wave in life. And I have made it work in mine. I know it works. Thousands of experiences have proved it to me. That if you will get into that flow, and will go with that flow, that there is a power that sustains you, that will sustain you. Faith is much more practical than most people realize. With faith, there is nothing you cannot accomplish. I have always believed it. I have also proved it. And these lessons which I have written, I myself am amazed by them. I didn't know I knew all that. It isn't I who am writing it. It's a greater wisdom that is flowing through me. I was just working on one lesson last night, and I thought, oh, this is my guru. I wouldn't have said these things, but with his consciousness, I knew them. With his consciousness, I could express them. <clears throat> my reason for inviting you to be my partners in this great vision is that I know that India can come up, will come up, but is not coming up as it could. There is not enough truthfulness. I was, I, I'm a playwright among other things, and I wrote a play uh, when I was in America, and I wanted a, an Indian friend of mine to lend me a dhoti for this play because it was set in India. And there was a friend of his there. And this friend, as I was leaving, said, I will definitely be there. I thought, he hasn't asked me when, he hasn't asked me where, he hasn't asked me what. I know he won't come. He didn't come. But why that word definitely? It's not right to say something. When I say I'm going to go out and buy a newspaper and later on I decide I'm, I don't want to because it's raining, I'll go anyway because I said it. Even if I said it only to myself. When you say something, do it. When you commit yourself, come, follow through on your commitment. These principles are very important. Otherwise, you become sort of like jelly. You don't have a straight spine. 
These principles of yoga, which are the backbone of India, will bring India up again. India and America are destined to work together. America, because of its material,